Good afternoon to the over 500 people who registered for this panel. We could have filled the Writers Guild Theater with the amount of attention and desire people have, people have to have a mentor. So everybody, thank you for being here. And I want to welcome Jen Oxenberg, Winnie Holtzman, Dustin Latz Blank, Ken Levine, and Gloria Calderon Kellett. If we were at the theater, there'll be thunderous applause. So I'll do it on my end. Thank you for being here. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Larry. You're welcome. Uh, as I was prepping this, there are two phrases that came into my mind. Uh, one is the to much to whom much has been given, much is expected. And if I appear tall, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. And all of you have become shoulders of giants or other people. And no doubt you have been mentored by other people before. So let me ask a question that will no doubt come up on my screen here. Is do you even need a mentor in this business? Anyway. Well, I will say, uh, you know, Winnie doesn't know it, but she's been my mentor for 15 years because I would study her work uh, and watch my so-called life again and again and break it down. And uh, Post-its is one of my favorite short plays, Winnie. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so it's this is such a full circle moment for me because um, I've been such a long time admirer and studying uh, your work at the Paley Center back when it was the TV Museum of TV and Radio. I would just check it out and sit there for hours breaking Aww. down your stuff. So it's so nice to be on this panel with you. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I was, I was, thank you so much for that, Gloria. That's lovely to hear. Of course, that's really meaningful. Um, I was gonna say that I think we need mentors in life. I don't think it's about a business. I think it's very natural and human to admire and look up to those who've come before us. And like, I, I have this memory in my mind of, of my husband and I were at a special award show for magicians. And there was a table next to us, it was the oldest magicians in the room. They were like in their 80s and 90s and 70s. And you could see all the young ma magicians 19, 20, they start young, you know, coming up to that table just to be in the presence of those older ma magicians because it's a craft that's passed down and people get inspired by seeing it and they want to do it too. And that forms this depth of love in your heart. So to me, it's not about business so much. It's about incredible adoration and love that you have for your craft which Gloria you just expressed it we've never met we've never met but we are so connected and that's what I that's what I feel like this is thank you anyone else um, <clears throat> I, I'll just say I, I had a, a mentor for many years we didn't we didn't meet until he was 81 uh, and, and he lived for a good long time after that. And, and I, he was a writer, he, he'd done a lot of novels um, and some science fiction stuff. And most, and I miss him terribly because he was, can we swear on here? You can do yeah, whatever you want. Right? Yeah, he would just, I would give him drafts of my stuff and he was ruthless about saying, what you've written is bullshit. Like this is, you know, I saw this on this show in this year, that year, you know, where are you in this? And you know, I, I miss having someone in my life who would challenge me in that way, also make me laugh. And, you know, he was, he was brutal. And in his brutality, there was a great deal of humor. And we need that uh, in this business. But it's, you know, every now and then or all the frickin' time, we lose our objectivity, you know. And sometimes we don't recognize when something we've done is good. And often we don't recognize it when it's derivative or terrible. And it's great to have a nice mentor who can be your your, your bullshit meter. I, I dig that. And let me stop just for a second uh, because we had some little tech problems. Everyone, I want to introduce you to Jen Oxenberg and Ken Levine. Thank you for joining us. We just got started and the question on the table was, do you even need a mentor? And we and 
Dustin has brought us to who is mentor what. So now you're caught up. So anyone else wants to take that? Um, yeah, I'll take it if you don't mind. Please. Go um, well, I was very fortunate in my career to have great mentors like Larry Gelbart and the Charles brothers and Jim Brooks. And I grew so much as a writer as a result of it. And so for me, I feel so fortunate and the chance to give back, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do it. I, I teach, I have a blog, I have a podcast, uh, as many ways as I can to try to pay it forward because I consider myself so lucky. I am so much better a writer as a result of having learned from those guys and how lucky I was. I mean, it's like if you're a pitcher and you get to learn from Sandy Koufax. Uh, Ken, can I pimp you out just for a second? Uh, you all should be reading Ken's blog. Uh, Ken, your blog about deconstructing the story structure of MASH was the master's class for me, so thank you for that. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, pimping over. Uh, Jan, are you with us? I am with you. Can you see me? Oh, Jan Oxenberg, are you with us? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, hey, there you are. Oh, here I am. Okay. I would just like to say that um, I'm very honored to be on this panel. Winnie told me about the panel and I asked if I could be a viewer. And, and uh, <laughs> I'm happy to do it. Um, and I have uh, prepared nothing, which um, I think is uh, the best way to do this. So let me tell you about how I was mentored. I was mentored by a movement of people. You know, I started out uh, as an independent filmmaker in New York, writing you know, in a community of people who, um, who weren't trying to make it in Hollywood. You know, our ethos was that we were, we were it, the thing you needed to do was to be original, to be different, not to figure out what somebody else wanted but to figure out something that had never been mm -hmm. done before. And so that was where the peer pressure was, you know, sort of a group of people who, you know, got our films into Sundance and went on to have more mainstream careers because of that. But we started out with the ethos at, that we mentored each other in of having an original voice not figuring out what a network wanted. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to get back to that and sort of, you know, having groups of supportive groups of writers to support each other in that ethos. Thank you for that. Uh, let, let, Jen, let me ask you, uh, you had a mentor I am assuming along the way or mentors along the way? Well, oddly enough, Larry Gelbart was also kind of a mentor for me. My first professional writing job was a miniseries that he was the creative consultant for. Um, and to me, he was like a god. I mean, he's not just a god to me. He is like a god of writing. And, uh, um, and one of the most generous... I mean, I'm just nothing. I'm like this little nothing person, but... Um, he valued what I, what I did. And, uh, you know, that was an incredible uh, gift to me. Um, and then I would, I would agree with Gloria. I've been mentored by people who seem to be my peers, but I think of them as mentors like Winnie, for example. Mm -hmm. This is a very good example. Jason Kadams, who I met at the Sundance Writers Lab, who um, asked me to write for television. That's how I got into TV. Uh, I feel like he was a mentor to me. And Larry, I'll put you on the list. Too. Oh, oh, how you're so kind. Oh, but Jan, you said something I want to go back to. You said that you were a little nothing when you got your mentor. I think it's very common for people who are watching us to think that we are infallible. But for all of you, how green were you when you found your mentor? When you look back, or the moments that you said, my God, I don't believe I did that or said that or handed that in. Well, 
can I, is, is it okay if I jump in? Yeah, this is all for all of us. Um, my first real, my big, I've had, like Ken Levine, I've had an embarrassment of riches of amazing mentors. But, um, and Ken's an amazing mentor. He, my best friend is Robin Schiff and she says hello and she was mentored by Ken as I'm sure many people were. But um, I know many people were, but my mentor was Arthur Lawrence who wrote, uh, he's a great book writer of musicals. He wrote the book to West Side Story and he wrote the incredible book to the movie, uh, the, um, the musical Gypsy. And I met him because I got accepted to a program where he was teaching and an amazing array of luminaries of the musical theater world were teaching in this program. And um, obviously I learned a lot. I, I learned, I can't even tell you how many times I think about stuff that Arthur said to me while I'm writing. But the thing that really Im uh, impacted us, and we were a group of students, I was in my late 20s, you know, mid to late 20s, is that these people were all older, but they all still had busy careers. They were busy. They were, they were not retired. And it really, it, it really hit me that they were making time for us because they believed it was an important thing to do. So that impacted me and made me cognizant. And of course, if you are still writing, and I am thankfully still writing, you have to really balance how much you can be around people and giving to others and how much you need to be alone. And that's a huge part of my life that I still feel a lot of confusion about. So what I've done is I've been inspired by those incredible people who mentored me. And then Marshall Herskovitz and Edward Zwick mentored me again. So I got super lucky, but I'm just saying that I've, I, fe I feel like Ken was saying, I feel I must pass it on and I do pass it on, I think, but I have to always balance, balance, balance between my own work and how much I'm gonna be around other people. I think that's a really great point. And I think that it's also really important to note that for a lot of us out here, like I don't think I had a mentor. I mean, I had, we have to look at what we mean by the word mentor because with writing specifically, the work can be our mentor. You know, like I was saying to Winnie at the beginning of this, we can study the work of the people that came before us. I'm watching a lot of Dick Van Dyke right now, and that's leading me down a beautiful road because that stuff really holds up. Like we as writers have the work. And until I think there's this, this, this um, deep passion of like, oh my God, if I don't have a mentor, I'm screwed. And I don't think that's true. I don't think the first 10 years of my career, I really had a mentor with the exception of the work that was there for me to study and was there for me to look at. And then once I got into this industry a little bit more and met more people, you know, Pam Freiman became an incredible mentor to me for directing and Norman Lear became an incredible, but really those, those were more allies than mentors. They were people that were supporting me, that knew my work and that were lifting up my voice. And so for anyone out there that feels like, oh my gosh, I don't have a mentor, I'm screwed. I don't think that's true because we're writers. And I think that we can look to the work. We really can. Like we're all in quarantine right now. My gosh, go back and look at the great work and just be inspired by it and sit and break it down. And it's, it's a real, I think it's a real gift that, that this is what we do. Gloria, can I, can I ask you a question? Uh, yes, what would you can. <laughs> Looks so cute. I love seeing everyone at home. Uh, bring your dogs, please. Uh, what do you consider some of the great work to look at? What What are you looking at now? I mean, for me, you know, I really love the shows I grew up on. I always try to think of like why they invoke certain feelings in me, because I think I like to I like to be on staff because you're in the service of someone else. But when you are creating content, you have to sort of sit quietly with what do you want to say to what you were, to your point, Jan, of like, what do I have to say, Gloria? So sometimes I like to sit in other people's work and see what did they have to say to me and how did that make me feel? And the shows I loved growing up, you know, the My So-Called Life and 
and 30 something and mad about you and friends and what did those shows invoke in me that made me feel what I felt? And then what do I, Gloria, have to say? And what is my specific voice filtered through that? So I go back, I'm watching a lot of cheer. I'm watching a lot of comedy right now because I need to for my mental well-being. So I'm watching Cheers and Golden Girls and Dick Van Dyke. And I'm looking at why some of those hold up so beautifully. Why those are so, why these actors were just infusing it with, to me, a theatricality, which is why I love multicam, because to me, when it's at its best, it's a play that we just have the privilege of watching with other people in our homes. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm sitting. And then I'm sitting in what, what do I want to create in this time? What do I have to say to the world? How am I trying to provide a salve in my writing to, to heal uh, society? <laughs> I, I like to think broadly, not that I think I can heal society in any way, but that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make stuff that's a hug. You know, I feel like one day at a time's a hug. That's what I'm trying to write. Uh, so that's, that's kind of how I, I look at it. You know, I, yeah, I, I, I have to say, with... no, go ahead, Ken. Okay. Um, when my partner, David Isaacs, and I started out, uh, we knew absolutely nothing. And the way we really learned, once we found out that you had to write a spec script from an existing show, and the Mary Tyler Moore show was the one that we admired and we felt that was the closest to our voice, once we did that, we sat, and this was like back in the days before, you know, DVRs or VCRs, so we would have to sit on Saturday night and watch the Mary Tyler Moore show. Fortunately, I didn't have a girlfriend, so I was able to do that. And I would hold a silver dollar microphone up to the speaker and would record the show. And then David and I would go back and make an outline of that episode. Oh. And we did that week after week after week. And eventually mm. we started seeing the patterns. So. Yes. Especially now when you can binge watch shows and everything, I think a, a great mentor is Netflix and Hulu. <laughs> it's really true. You know, I, I wish we had an hour and a half as we usually do at the NPR, but we have a lot of ground to cover in a little amount of time. So I'm just going to move on. Uh, but feel free to circle back to something else we, we've covered. A question from uh, the group that's watching. How do you find a mentor when you're middle aged? because it seems that people who are chosen are right out of film school or in their 20s. I think part of the answer is community. And do you have, are you part of, or taking part in some kind of community? It doesn't have to be big, huge, but you know, that is a re that obviously is a challenging question because I know, you know, I'll just be honest. I, a lot of the people I've mentored, yeah, they're young, absolutely. I, I haven't said to myself, I must only mentor a young person, but uh, I guess I have seen it in some ways as a generational thing. Um, <clears throat> but I think this brings up the whole issue of how do we stay connected? What, how do we get ourselves out there? Because no one in a, well, I shouldn't say no one. It's very hard to want to mentor someone if you haven't, if you haven't been struck by something about them. Although I have to say a lot of the people I've mentored have been my assistants and they were, they were working for me as my assistant. And in many ways I was mentoring them even before I read any of their stuff. And some of them, I never read their stuff. It wasn't oh, about, it when wasn't about it, reading their stuff. It was just about encouraging them. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Winnie. I would never want to interrupt you, but uh, you bring up a very good general point. No matter how old you are, what is the X factor? What makes you say yes to person <clears throat> X and not person Y? Do I so feel the person has talent and potential? Okay. That's Anyone right. Else? Well, yeah, the, I think they're fearless and not lazy. I mean, I, I, you know, when I when I meet someone who thinks it's done at a first draft, I, I'm not interested in helping them out. Uh, when I meet someone who's determined and has 
been working on something for some time, I think, okay, they've got it in. They understand it's a process. Uh, and so that's very appealing to me. I, I, I do, I, for me though, mostly I've, I've worked with um, authors who've written books, whether they're fiction or nonfiction. And, um, and, uh, and, and I, I, I help with those adaptations. And so there you can already see the spark of an original voice. And I do think someone said that earlier. I do think that's so incredibly valuable. I, I know for me, uh, my, my first mentorship was that uh, about 15 years old and it was in a theater. Um, and it was, be I was, I've told this story before, but you know, I was quite suicidal uh, because I was a Mormon gay kid. And, uh, and my mentor, my very first lesson from a mentor is, the fact that you're so very different that you're not sure you fit in is why you'll probably make a good writer. Uh, and, and all of a sudden I had a little bit of a silver lining in that dark closet of mine. So I, I look for that um, special spark, that, that difference in, in what I read in the, in the folks who I like to help. Yeah, I, I sort of look at it as a sliding scale. I'm not gonna get the same amount of involved with every person I encounter. I do try to be helpful to people when I encounter them. That might be a really brief encounter. Then I have people who've been in my life for years, not just assistants, people that I've just come up upon them and we're having a conversation and it's an ongoing conversation. But one thing I have to say is there's a difference between wanting a mentor and feeling like that person is going to come into your life and save it. And that's not a possible thing for me. Like if I pick up on that, um, I'm not trying to be judgmental, but that's not going to help me to quote someone who I adore, Cameron Crowe, that's not going to help me help you. If you're feeling like I could save your life, hopefully, or save your career, or because only, and I'm saying that from experience of being mentored, but I never thought that those people were making it happen for me in the, in the bigger sense. It was always me risking and, and stepping out on that high diving board. Winnie, what do you do with those people who want to be mentored by you that love Wicked or my so-called wife a little too much? There's no, such <laughs> thing. no, I didn't mean it like that. There's no such thing as too much love. No, there's no such thing as too much love. No, I, 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 I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll be honest, that gets to a bit of etiquette. We, no, we, no, no, it's, let me give you an example. Okay, please. I try to do these panels, I mean, hopefully we'll someday again soon do them in, in, in real places with where we can all see each other properly. I try to do them, and very often when I do them, and I've been doing them for many years, people, somebody will come up to me at the end and they say, how can I get in touch with you? And I'm very, I, I very often will say, this is it. This is the way we're being in touch. This is the thing I did tonight. And we're in touch now. If you want to say something, say it. If you want to ask something, ask it. But I'm not going to give you my email. You're a total stranger. And I just came to be a mentor for two hours. I'm not saying that helps everybody, but I'm doing my best, if you see what I mean. I have to have limits because otherwise I'll, I would get even less done than I'm already getting done. Winnie, you were smooth. <laughs> you know, but I mean, we, we, all are, we all have a full-time job already and we have to be good at that job. So it's, it is a big ask. I, I have a YouTube series that I will plug right now that's free. It's 10 episodes. It's my master class. I partnered with Beto Like in YouTube and it is free online. And it's kind of, if you wanted to have coffee with me, it's like 10 hours of me talking for way too long <laughs> about everything I think about the industry. And one of it is decorum. And when somebody is taking the time, you guys, showrunners are so busy. Writers are so busy. It is such an enormous thing when they can come out to, the, to a theater and give you two hours of their time. Thank you is what the response should be there. And then you have to save you. And the great thing about writing is you can. You can save yourself with the work. 
You can save yourself. What draws me to a mentee is hustle, is somebody who's a hustler without making me feel bad about it. If I'm out here doing it, don't make me the asshole because I'm not going to read your work. What? How did I become the asshole? I'm here to try to help you out, right? We have to think about it in terms of that. And I think that, oh my gosh, don't touch your face, Gloria. I know, but I've been, been in quarantine for three, three hey, Gloria, weeks. Does that, come, does, that, does that come from experience being being uh, labeled the asshole for not wanting to uh, take someone on? No, nobody, nobody has called me an asshole, but I feel, I do, when you go and do some of these talks, some people are incredibly respectful and some people are like, here's my script, here's my, they want more. And I think that's rude. <laughs> I'm just gonna call it out, I think it's rude. Because when I would go and speak, I was just so grateful to hear, oh my God, to have heard any of these people speak for five minutes, to have a question answered, oh my gosh, what, what a gift that would have been. And so I also feel like people need to check themselves and they need to check uh, what work are they doing? Because more often than not, I don't read anybody, nobody. And yeah, an assistant yeah. of mine has to work for me for at least a year before I'll read them. Because... Yeah. Most of the time, what is the end game? What I think people want is they want me to read it and go, oh my God, you're a genius. <laughs> Please, in every show. Why do you want me to read it? If I'm not staffing, if I'm not, why do you want your work to be read? You should be in community with other writers that are in your peer group. You guys should be reading each other's work. The amount of people that send first drafts, drafts to agencies, the amount of people when I'm staffing every year because I take a, I, I'm very anal retentive and I have a whole list of everybody I read and what I thought of their scripts. Sometimes the thing I'm staffing is a family thing. So reading your like super sexy single show is not appropriate for, to, for me to judge in this context if you can write one day at a time. But, oh, I sold a pilot to CBS and it's about young sexy singles. So I'm going to revisit this writer from three, three years ago and I'm going to ask their agent about their new piece of material. And what I've heard so many times is, that's all the material they have. It's been three years. They don't, they should have 20 pieces of material. Now, maybe their agent only saw three of them, but it is bonkers crazy pants to me that writers are not constantly writing and rewriting and rewriting and writing something new and having a short play and having a hustle. I like the hustle. All right. So I, I feel like writers get a little amen, lazy. They write amen. I, I feel the passion. I feel the passion. Uh, hustle. So y'all, you got to do Right now, y'all in quarantine. You guys, after this, should be typing away. Well, it's just like I know how hard I work. I mean, when I say hard, I mean how many drafts I do, which is countless. I mean, I'm being serious. So it's like I want. I love what I love what you just said, Gloria. Awesome, and what what Dustin said about I want to feel like they're really rewriting. I want. I want. I want to see that because that's. I'm not asking you to do anything I don't do. Got it. Hey, hey uh, Dustin, I want to ask you a question that will be brought into everybody else. When after a, a panel, someone says the inevitable, can I, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Yes, the always. The answer to that is always yes, I want coffee, especially in the middle of this panel. It's, I'm in London, so it's like, like <laughs> it's past my bedtime. And y'all have so much damn energy, so if someone wants to buy me a coffee, I don't care. I'll read the damn script right now. I want that coffee. I need it in me. Something else, uh, that Joe saw. Sorry, and Winnie, the energy. Uh, no, go on. Sorry, I cut you off. No, no, you, you got a second win. Something that Joe Soloway says. No one, no one ever says, "I'll buy you sushi" or "I'll buy you tequila." It's always coffee. <laughs> oh, even better. I'll read two scripts for sushi and tequila. Uh, I mean, it, it usually. I, I have. I think. I, I think when he was just saying it, I, uh, or maybe it was Gloria. The, you know, I, I often say, great. But if you have a finished script, you need to go make pals with producers and directors and, you know, that sort of thing. I, I, if it's really, really good, I might have to throw it away and, and make you go away so you don't take my damn jobs. Like, I'm not the guy to, I, that's half a joke. But the, you know, it's a, I'm not necessarily the one to do that with. Um, I do, I, I will say, I'm getting this down. I've lived over here for about five years. I live very far away from anything that resembles Hollywood. And I kind of miss it. So. As much as I know you guys are getting inundated with people saying, please read my script, I kind of miss it every now and then. Sort of miss it. Miss Don't worry, it's waiting here for you. Yeah, yeah, you're going to get a thousand scripts tomorrow. Yeah, well, send me yours. I'll, I'll read that in a minute. Yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, it's a, 
there is something to that community of writers. And I used to always go write at the, um, at the coffee shop in West Hollywood. And there are many writers in there. And it, it was just, it was, it's motivating, it's focusing. And, and we did try our best to read each other's stuff. Uh, it was particularly helpful when uh, you had friends who write very different genres than you do. I think we can give, have a lot of objectivity and there's no competitive thing going on. Not that, you know, that does sneak in every now and then. So it was always lovely to have that communal experience um, with writers. I really do, same in a writer's room. I really, really do miss that. So, you know, I'm probably the easiest target for reading someone's script right now. I hope that doesn't mean my inbox is full by morning. <laughs> well, I, I, I think you just opened the, 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 uh, the door there, Dustin, good luck. Send me science fiction. I, I, I write all this political stuff, but you know what I love? Science fiction. That's the, that's the shit. I can't write it to save my life, but I love reading it. There's a, a question from, from the group. Uh, as a mentor, how do you give criticism without destroying someone's soul? <laughs> well, that's a really good well, question. I, well, go yeah. ahead, Jen. Go ahead. Well, I do try to destroy people's souls. I know. I should. I mean, you know, part of I I think that being a mentor is having hopefully having a tremendous respect for the person that you're mentoring, whatever the age relationship is. You know, I want to sort of go back a little bit to that question about a middle-aged person looking for a mentor. I was kind of in that position because having started as an independent filmmaker and taken a long time to make the feature film that you know sort of launched my career, by the time I started as a TV writer, uh, I was, I, you know, I felt like I was too old to get a mentor. But, you know, I think that, and this relates to what I wanted to say, I'll try to get it back to destroying people's souls. You know, <laughs> There's an arbitrariness that I think is unfair. Uh, you know, many people watching this panel may feel like, oh, you know, you said something clever to Gloria or Dustin in a coffee shop or Winnie and, you know, and they agreed to do something or be nice to you. Other than the established mentorship programs, you know, are we saying to people, work hard and be lucky? You know, that's, it's a, it's a little bit, there is a, an element of, of luck. And I guess there's nothing we can do about that because that's the way life is. Um, but I would say this to those of us who would sort of be in the position, I think you're always both mentoring and being mentored. That's the way I like to think of it. And whether it's age, whether it's, you know, the person isn't, uh, doesn't have a lot of produced credit. I feel like being open to seeing the value of someone else and not just feeling a level of comfort, like, oh, this person is in the right category for me to mentor them. I feel like that's something that we can do to have an openness to being surprised by somebody who's in their 80s and wants to be mentored because they always wanted, you know, they have this incredible talent. So, you know, as far as giving criticism, I feel like back to something, you know, everyone has said, if you are committed to working hard, then you will not be destroyed by criticism. You will crave it. You will say thank you when you get honest feedback. So that to me is something that every writer. Yeah. You know, if you're going to be in this business and your soul is going to be destroyed by having your work critiqued, my soul is destroyed every time it's sometimes I mean, say it's perfect too. I you mean, know, Jan, but look what happened to me last week. I mean, last week I got a phone call. My um, someone very close to me and I had finished our draft of a screenplay. Uh, together, and uh, we got a phone call that was all critique, it, uh, criticism. It was nothing positive. I didn't hear anything positive except, um, yeah, it was a lot like your pitch. That was all. <laughs> that was all. But, um, <laughs> but um, they, I could, I can honestly say they disliked it. The person who was giving me the news, and, and you're with Wilson. <laughs> it was hard. It was hard 
And, you know, you have, look, I don't actually give criticism that way. I always strive to, to um, find what I think is working because there's usually something that's working that you can talk about to help people see what is working. But I just want to say, I don't do, all of this is stuff I'm living now at 65 years old. It's not like I got a shot and I'm immune now. And that doesn't happen to me anymore. That happened to me two days, three days ago or whatever. And I had to get over it because I have something else to do that I have to write. So I can't be sitting there going, gee, I just realized I'm an idiot. I'm really bad at this. I mean, that crossed my mind for a few hours, but I had to like let that go. And so in other words, if you have harsh criticism and Arthur Lawrence, if you can ask, you can go look at it up. There was really no one harsher, I, I would have to say, in New York <laughs> than Arthur Lawrence was in giving criticism. It's a good training ground. I, I'm just saying, I'm echoing what, what I think we're all saying, which is not to be afraid of it. It does make you stronger. It doesn't mean they're right about everything. I've certainly had criticisms where three years later I went, oh my God, I understand what they finally, I finally understand what they meant and it's a good idea. I mean, it took me like three years. Thank you for that. I think also consider the source, you know, consider the source of the criticism. I think what's so valuable, because some people are asking about what do you look for in a peer group? What I looked for in a peer group is people whose work I liked. I liked the work that they were producing. I liked the plays they were writing. I liked the screenplays. And so their opinion was valuable to me because I responded to their work. There are, all of us deal with executives, some of whom are very smart and give very thoughtful notes that make a project better. And some who are frankly trying to legitimize their job. So give silly, ridiculous notes that don't make the project better. And we have to maneuver between what is helpful to the project and what is not. I like getting good notes. I love getting good notes. It elevates the work. It makes me think more critically about what I'm trying to say and how I can communicate that better in the word. So that's wildly helpful. And yeah, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna be crushed, I mean, you guys, critics will crush you. So you've gotta at least sit with, I'm proud of what I put out into the world. And if, hopefully some people will like it and some people won't, and that's okay. There's shows that are some people's favorite shows that are not for me, you know? So it's also, uh, it's, you have to, you have to roll with that. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to echo, what everyone is saying, um, you know, I write plays now, I write full length plays. And one of my mentors is Treva Silverman, who wrote so many great Mary Tyler Moore shows. And the reason I love Treva is because she's really tough. She's really mm -hmm. tough on stuff. And there was one play that I wrote where I, um, I gave it to her, I was very proud of it. And she called me up and she said, it's a great idea. It's a great idea. And the first act is lovely. You have no second act. And I threw out the entire second act and wrote another one. And the play wound up getting produced in a number of places. But uh, what saved the whole project was Treva saying, throw out the whole second act. You got to do it. Uh, let me advance the ball a bit. How often have a protege become a friend, have, have joined your professional and social circle? A few times. They all hate me afterwards, I don't know. Uh, I had trouble always. hearing the, the first part of that, I'm so sorry. Yeah, how often has a protege become a friend, someone who's joined your social and professional circle, or do you keep a firewall between mentorship and friendship? It's happened to me several times, uh, as Winnie said, Robin Schiff and uh, Danielle Sanchez and a number of other writers who, uh, who now I consider just peers, contemporaries and friends. Yeah, I think it depends. Some, some I've hired former students of mine uh, as writers and we're still very friendly. I'm, I'm very close to Pam Fryman and obviously Norman. So uh, I worked for Cameron Crowe as well. That was my first big Hollywood job was working for Cameron and I still get Christmas cards from him every year. 
Oh, that's cool. I feel like he mentored me before I ever met him. Like you yeah, were the work. again, the work. Yeah. And he he's younger than me. It, you know, I don't think it has anything to do with age, really. Um, not really. It's just that <laughs> younger people, and I hate to say this if I'm offending anyone. I mean, I'm an older person. Um, younger people can be more malleable, more open to to listening. They can be. I'm not saying everybody. I don't mean to be offensive. No, I don't think you are at all. Uh, a question from the group. It's often said that Hollywood is looking for new voices. Did, did you have a mentor? Say again. Did I lose? Yes, Jan. I think she said, "Do you?" Oh have no, a I, I was asking Larry if you had a mentor. Uh, yes, my well, I've had, I've had so many along the way, but the two major ones is Dan Petrie Jr., who was nominated for an Oscar for Beverly Hills Cop, who took me in when I was basically just off the street you know, green as a cucumber and was so patient with me <laughs> as I crawled my way up to the middle. And then Graham Yost, who wrote Speed, uh, who I was co-EP on one of his shows and was the most kind Canadian I ever met. Uh, and that's why I get to stand here and sit here and moderate stars like you. Uh, there's a question from the group that Hollywood has often said they're looking for new voices. How, what's the last new voice you read? A voice where you went, wow, this is, might be hard to sell, but I haven't seen this voice before. Well, I, I would say it's not someone I've read, but I've seen her work, Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, her work is uh, very singular and, you know, we see it all finished. We, we see the finished product, but, uh, you know, it actually, um, her Amazon series, you know, started, I think, as a one woman play that she did at the Edinburgh Fringe mm -hmm. Festival. You know, these things have developed for years and years before they spring perfect uh, onto our screens. So that's one I would throw out. I, I saw I this really play. Uh, oh. I saw this play called Slave Play in New York City this past fall. Now I'm blanking on the name of that, of that writer. I know he's young. <clears throat> I've just never seen anything like it. I thought his voice was amazing. Um, right. He was obviously on Broadway, but just like Jan just said, there's a lot you don't see you know, I'm a good audience too, and I'll watch something like that, and I'll, I'll, I'll feel like, in, you know, uh, I'll feel so daunted by his brilliance, and I'll forget that that probably is years and years and years of rewriting that that slave play. I, I'm going to guess. I'm, I don't know for sure because I don't know him, but yeah, he's thirty. Jeremy O'Harris is the playwright. Right. Right. I mean, people, I have asked me how, people have asked me how many drafts I did of Wicked. I literally can't count. I don't even want to count. I can't count them. Um, I want to read every draft. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that would be no, a massive no. test to, to see the germination of the first draft to the, uh, the finished product. Uh, have you ever been burned by a protege? Have you chosen wrong? And how did that look? What did that look like? Uh, I have had a situation wherein I've hired former students before. And my feeling when doing that was always, it's a first, it's an entry level first job. Uh, we were in a position though, where I, I was able to hire some on staff and I was able to hire others as PA or writer's assistant positions. And what I found is when you're in season three of a show and some the writers that started as staff writer are now executive story editor or co-producers and the PAs are still PAs, there's a, res a resentment that builds that why were these people chosen and not me and the, the relationship uh, sort of turns. And so that was very uh, disheartening for me because I was hoping 
you know, also when you, when you have an opportunity to, P, to be a PA or a writer's assistant, that doesn't mean that you're going to get a job on that show. It means that's your first job in and your responsibility is to continue to make relationships and be, be grateful. I, I definitely sense a lack of, of overall gratitude because it took me a really long time to break into Hollywood because I knew nobody. Uh, I was also having to break into dominant culture shows because there weren't a lot of Latino shows uh, out there for me to be writing on. And so every step of the journey, I was so grateful. But when I became second assistant to Cameron Crowe, I didn't think I was going to end up co-writing things with Cameron. You know, <laughs> I was just so grateful to be in the space, to learn, to sit, observe. Oh my gosh, I get to sit in and take notes on a phone call and hear how this master deals with the studio. What a gift. Mm -hmm. I think that's a little bit lost. And I think a lot of people feel like, oh, if I'm somebody's assistant, that means I'm going to be on staff or if I'm a PA, then eventually they're going to hire me. That's not the case. And I don't think that should be the case. I think that you need to keep on doing the work along the way. And so uh, it has made me a little bit more gun shy about giving certain people entry level positions because I now, or I make it crystal clear that their, my job is not to get them their next job. My job is a showrunner to make a show. So they have the opportunity to be on the show and they should use the opportunity. They do their job, of course, very well, but then use the opportunity to continue writing, to make your own connections so that when people go on to do their next shows, they'll remember how wonderful you were on that show. I mean, that's how I got, how I met your mother is I met, the, I met Carter and Craig on, on another show and they liked me. And so when that show went, I got to go work on that show. There was never, I just, I worry about people assuming that they're somehow owed something uh, by being in your presence or by uh, having a, an entry level position. It, it's been a little disheartening and, and shocking to me. <laughs> the, I hear um, that. Does anyone else have a similar where people lost the sense of gratitude or assumed more than that they were going to get from you? Well, once this is, I have to mainly say that I've had so incredibly great experiences, 99%. I had one time, this is a really long time ago, I was um, meant, I was put together with somebody in a, in, a film, in a film class, like to give them feedback. And they, and they weren't, they didn't seem to be really interested in my feedback. Um, it, was, it was like they were just, it was, it was fine how it was. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. Um, I just wanna also say, you know, when I was talking about somebody on Broadway, I don't mean to be disrespectful and say, oh, so just do that, just get your show on Broadway. Oh. But I do think that what I'm trying to say is that there's ways to, I guess, that's why I use the word community, to get out in your community wherever people are doing theater or making things themselves, certainly online, but to find ways to get your stuff made and out there because if nothing else, you'll learn a lot from that process. I think learning is an optimum word here. Like, how do I learn? How do I get better? Thank you. I agree, Winnie. I think that given that all the platforms that we have now to feature our voice, you know, whether it's your Twitter feed or your play um, or a video that you do, you know, or a YouTube channel that you create. If you're a creator, create. You know, if you're not in a formal mentorship program, the best way to attract a mentor is to give them something to get excited about. I think several people have said that. And there are so many avenues by which we can do that now. Yeah, I have a, a since we only have minutes to go, uh, Let's just be real for a couple of minutes, shall we? Oh. Uh oh. <laughs> yes. Um, Are we in trouble? Oh, you no, want me to no, be more no. real? Listen, there's no one watching this, so we're good. Uh, is there <laughs> an expectation that if a woman comes to you and that there is this kind of like sister friend pack that you'll take me in? Or if a gay and lesbian writer comes to you, hey, well, we're part of the same subgroup, you're, you're going to bring me in, right? Is there, is, that, is there that expectation that because we're part of the same subgroup that I have a way into you? 
I hope not. I, I, I mean, I, I it, your, your work has to be good. I mean, it, it depends if it's, if I'm working on something that's LGBT related, then uh, certainly a, a queer writer has a leg up because they've got some stories to share. Like right now I'm working on a show that's predominantly women. So the entire staff is women because uh, that makes sense. Um, uh, so, you know, sometimes someone's identity is a leg up because they come loaded with a lot of, uh, you know, firsthand stories that they might bring to your show. And that's great. Um, but certainly I'm not going to hire a, a gay person just because they're gay. They got to be good and it's got to be the right show for them. Yeah, uh, I think, like, say, if you went to the same college, went to the same university, um, that kind of gives you an in and you sort of have a connection. But I don't think there's an obligation just because someone went to UCLA, I'm obligated to be their mentor. But, um, you know, if, if you do have something in common, I, I think it's a it's a great way to kind of establish a relationship. You take me uh, out to sushi when you can. Uh, Have it delivered to my house and we'll Zoom. Right, and with a doggy bag, extra. Yeah. Uh, it is sometimes said that white guys have the advantage in Hollywood because it's a white boys club. Is there any mm -hmm. truth to that? Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, oh, I- yeah. <laughs> Yeah, how can you, I mean, there's no denying that. And I feel pretty strongly that, you know, I have the privilege of being white, obviously. Um, I've always felt like an outsider. I guess I feel green inside, but I'm white and that's a privilege. It's other issues of being a woman, but it's true. Okay. I think, you know, one of my first big, uh, I was offered, I've talked about this before, but after doing my very first job, I was offered a triple bump to go on the George Lopez show, or I could repeat staff and go on How I Met Your Mother. And I, uh, I really thought about that long and hard because I knew that, first of all, I was young and I wanted to tell sexy dating stories, but I also very much sat with, if I as a Latina go on George Lopez this early on in my career, I will be uh, typecast as a Latina only writer. And I want them to know I'm a writer who can write the Latino experience, but I can also write dominant culture experiences. So I took an enormous pay cut to go to How I Met Your Mother and work in a dominant culture white room with lovely guys who are incredibly supportive and lovely. Uh, and I think it really was, uh, value added in terms of my career because I then spent the first 10 years of my career writing dominant culture shows so that by the time I did have the reins, I knew how it worked out there. And I, you know, I had some showrunners that were great and some showrunners who were not so great. All of them were valuable learning experiences in terms of what I wanted to do when I had the reins. And I, I think it was beneficial. So there's a, there's a lot of really great white guys too that are there to help and to be- Thank you. Kind and supportive. So find find the good white male allies, you guys. Listen, my, my mentors were white dudes, and they could not have been more supportive of a little kid from Brooklyn like me. So there's good people everywhere. Uh, in our final minute, can you all share with me one of your protege success stories where you feel like a proud papa or a proud mama? I have a bunch of them. I, I have a bunch of success stories from my protégés. My um, John Karen was an assistant for me, and uh, he's gone on to work. Right now, he's been working on The Sinner, but he's worked on a lot of TV shows. And um, Joel Sinensky was my assistant, and Liz Tigelar was my assistant. And Liz has been a, become a really big writer. Um, I never read Liz when she was my assistant. Mm -hmm. I never read her. She never asked me to read her. I've been eternally grateful for that. I was having a very busy year. And um, I just tried to encourage her and set a good example. And I, that's another way of mentoring. It isn't all about reading the script. Uh, I'm really proud of, 
I, I've had again a few that have gone to good things. A lot of mine, uh, either assistants or writers' assistants or researchers, become producers for some reason. Uh, so I'm hoping they'll employ me in the future. The but I do have um, at UCLA. I was teaching a class, and Stephen Canals was there, and I thought he was quite bright and very confident, which I love. Uh, and he came on to work as a researcher um, with me. And of course, now he's created Pose and writes and directs Pose. Uh, so I'm really proud of Stephen. It's great to watch. That's a good one. Okay, well, uh, for I'm... me, uh, for me, yeah, I would say uh, certainly Robin Schiff and Daniel Sanchez, uh, but my daughter, Annie Levine, and her partner, Jonathan Emerson. Boy, I was the toughest mentor ever on those two. <laughs> and uh, they have gone on and have a lovely career and they're currently co-executive producers on The Upshaws, which is this Wanda Sykes show that's coming to Netflix when they can finish making them. Um, but um, yeah, I'm proud. <laughs> Great. I have uh, two people I can mention, you know, um, when we did the veterans uh, writing mentorship program at the very beginning, one of our uh, veterans was a woman named April Fitzsimmons. Right. And uh, I'm so proud of April. And now I think she's got her own pilot, her own show going. Um, but she was, everything we've talked about here, she was a role model for. Her. She was very, very hardworking. She never felt in, never felt like she felt entitled. You know, she took what everyone had to give enthusiastically and just kept working on her own work. And, uh, and she immediately started giving back, you know, as a mentor herself. So, you know, that's one success story I feel very proud of. Um, and just recently, my most recent assistant, a woman named, a young, U USC graduate student named Katherine Houck uh, was working with me just all around. I saw somebody asked, you know, did you have to pick up somebody's prescriptions when you were the assistant to a director? Yeah, my, my assistants have to pick up stuff, you know. <laughs> you have to be able to want to do everything. So, um, but uh, she was very helpful to me in story and, uh, you know, everything that you want an assistant to be. And I just helped her, um, well, she just got a job as a story editor at an interactive company called Fictif. And I feel like the work that she did for me and the recommendation I was able to give her were a part of the reason that that happened. So. But I think the commonality is, is enthusiasm and a lack of entitlement. Yeah. Uh Yes. Oh, I was going to say for me, it's, it's, um, I have several that have just gone on to staff on a lot of shows, which that's the win, you know, Michelle Medeo and Carolyn Levitch and, uh, you know, uh, Tanya Siracho, I read her play and I'm the one that told Mark that we should hire her on Devious Maids. And she and I became like sisters. We became so close on that show and we dreamed in the bowels of Disney that one day we would have the, uh, have the privilege of being showrunners and then for the last few years we've been the only two latina showrunners uh in town so that that one feels the most um thrilling All right on that happy note thank you everybody for a fantastic hour those listening i hope you took notes because this is the best mentorship you'll get during our <laughs> quarantine take a have a great Thursday, everybody thank, thank you everybody thank you, thank you. Stay safe. Bye. Bye.